Hello, everybody. We're just going to wait another couple of minutes for folks to come in. Um, but while you're waiting, if you feel inclined, I would really love if you would uh, put into the chat window um, your affiliation, uh, what university, what research institution, or what company uh, you are a part of. And non-affiliated is an absolutely uh, fine response. Um, but it would be great to know who's in the room with us today uh, before we start or as we're getting started. So welcome. Uh, just put it into the chat window. Um, it's on the bar um, at the bottom of the screen. Kai Erdem, welcome. Hi, Louise. Hi, Daniel. Louis, Daniel. Great. I'm so happy to see all these universities. Hi, Lynn. It's been a really long time. I'm so happy to see you. Hi, Stephen. Um, big fan of Catapult. Hi, Andreas. Uh, coming, coming out of private interest is great. Waterloo, Canada, wonderful. Fraunhofer, fantastic. Uh, for those of you coming in, we're just taking another couple of minutes to get people settled. We have a pretty good um, registration. Um, so have a pretty good sense that people are, there's more people who are gonna come in asking folks to put their uh, affiliations into the chat window um, as we're getting ready. I think I'm going to um, begin getting going. Um, this is great to see, uh, you know, uh, Brazil, hi Ruben, um, Lab Tech Innovacio, love hearing that you're here. Uh, this is great. I, I'm going to get going because um, my, my work is to kind of set up, you know, where are we? Um, and for most of you who are in the, um, you know, the R&D space or in the academic space, the notion of antitrust is not necessarily uh, that um, doesn't necessarily come so much into um, importance, but um, with at the Linux Foundation, it actually is extremely important. And what is important about it is that um, you know you can take a moment to read this. Uh, what's important about it is that, um, and I and I call this out is that the Linux Foundation is a pre-competitive platform. And I think that it helps to kind of see what is happening at the Linux Foundation um, in, in that light. Uh, there are um, you know, over 850 projects um, and thousands of companies that are all working together um, and investing together. And so the pre-competitive platform enables cooperation and leverage development. And uh, part of that is because of the antitrust policy. So um, this is the agenda um, that we're working with today. Um, I'm gonna take a moment uh, to you know, welcome everybody and to introduce um, Anto and, and Marco. Um, and then I'm gonna kind of do a quick LF Energy overview um, uh, because we really wanna leave time um, at the end for discussion um, and to also take your questions um, during uh, during the conversation. And I will try and keep up with the chat window um, and uh, bring those questions in. Um, so the way that this um, gathering kind of took, you know, came to be is uh, that Marco uh, came to me and said, we really wanna try and figure out how to get more 
uh, academic and uh, labs involved in Everest. And Everest is a, um, it, it's, a it's an EV gateway um, that kind of um, provides interoperability. And, and Marco's going to talk a lot more about it. Uh, but what I recognize is that um, I, I think that there's a way that we have really under leveraged the academic community. A Anto has been um, remarkable and um, Aachen has been uh, deeply engaged, um, but I think that we could do better. And so I decided to kind of open it up a bit more and then also open it up to the whole community um, because I, I think that um, you know, everybody wants to know, well, where are we and, and how far along are we? Um, so I, I have a, oh gosh, where did it go? Um, are you seeing my screen top? <laughs> Uh, I want to introduce um, Marco, um, who is the CEO and co-founder of Penix. He has a PhD in theoretical physics. He successfully created several companies already, and his experience in the commercial drone industry brought him to start his next endeavor, uh, which is Everest, which is founded on open source software. Um, uh, Dr. Um, Antonello Monti, um, is the TAC chair, which is our technical advisory committee chair um, in uh, LF Energy. And this uh, means that not only uh, does he help to coordinate and ensure um, that the technical community is moving along, but he also really focuses on the relationship um, at the governing board. Um, so he, he has been an unbelievable partner to me. Um, he is based at um, our WTH Aachen University, and he is a scientist at Fraunhofer Fit. Um, and I think that you know, he's, he's gonna follow me um, in the conversation um, and, and then hopefully um, really uh, pick up and talk about, well, what, what is academic research and engagement and, and how can that make a difference? So I'm gonna start to move quickly here. Um, you know, at the foundation of what LF Energy is about um, is to remove carbon from our power buildings and transportation systems to provide the reduction in CO2 emissions that uh, will enable us to stay below one and a half uh, Celsius. And, you know, really what that means is that if 75% of our emissions can be found in power buildings and transportation. The effort that we put in here to actually build the non-differentiating software layers is going to be extremely important. Um, but we don't have enough time, we don't have enough resources, and we need interoperability and no vendor lock-in. Um, so those are the design constraints um, that I think are going to help us design a power system and, and you know and this is my challenge to everybody is not to be thinking exclusively about designing a power system that'll make sense in a hundred years from now um, but what about if we start thinking about actually in thousands of years and what would it be like to be designing a power system that is going to be um, make as much sense three thousand years from now as it does now um, so you know, this is the mission of LF Energy to provide a 21st century framework of action uh, for decarbonization using open source, open frameworks and reference architectures. And what we're trying to do is to create a support ecosystem of complementary projects. And if you're wondering who I am, my name, <laughs> my name is Julie Goodman and I'm the executive director and founder of LF Energy. And I've been pushing this marble up a steep hill on my knees and hands um, for about six years now. Um, so we went from being a very small foundation and we're beginning to grow at um, tremendous pace. We actually have started to take in uh, between one and three new members. Um, there are three levels, uh, strategic, uh, general and associate. And uh, most of the universities or all of the universities at this point are coming in as associate members. Um, we welcome um, your engagement and we welcome um, the lab's engagement as well. So uh, please consider joining. Um, these are our projects right now. Um, there are a couple that are missing. Um, 
but um, we're in the process of standing them up and uh, releasing them into the world. I think the one that's one of the ones that's missing is a SAM, which is the super advanced meter, um, which is a reference design for an N virtual node, a new meter. Um, and it's being driven by the Netherlands who's going to replace all 20 million. I'm very proud of that project. There's another um, e-mobility project called OCPP, a cloud connector um, that is also in a sandbox um, that we also have brought into the foundation. And we're about to bring in probably another three or four projects. So we have been growing exponentially. Um, the projects are housed at the Lennox Foundation and LF Energy is um, really the, the, the funding mechanism. Um, our membership dues come in and it enables us to kind of build a business plan um, with regards to marketing, with regards to um, building a capacity with our maintainers. Um, and at the heart of what we do is open source. And, you know, there are many different ways to think about open source. I think of it really principally as a permissive intellectual property license that enables shared investment and leverage development. Because what we want is to not only have the software, but we want to commercialize it. Um, and so even the work that's being done that's more in R&D at universities, we want your software and we want your projects and we want to be able to kind of get them over that chasm um, so that they can become commercialized. And, and that really is one of the primary roles of LF Energy is to help commercialize. Um, today's open source software uh, probably is about 80, 90% of the entire stack. And um, that may come as a shock to people because um, particularly in the energy sector, I think that there's a thought that open source has not, nothing to do with us. Um, but in fact, in every single industry, um, open source is pervasive. What we wanna be able to do is make it safe um, because critical infrastructure um, like we are working on um, needs to be safe. Um, this is kind of gives you a big overview blast of what's happening at the Linux Foundation in terms of the amount of code, the amount of projects, the amount of um, uh, contributor licenses, um, what is going on. Uh, we will share this deck with everybody so you can kind of look at it more closely. Um, open source um, is on an exponential curve and it's really hitting that. You can see that by the number of uh, libraries that you might find, for instance, at GitHub or in GitLab. Um, but you know that doesn't necessarily mean um, that that the value, you know, that the value ends up being um, really probably in a much smaller group. Um, and that's where we want to be building ecosystems: is in the projects that have value. Um, and that have community. Um, and to some extent, part of what happens when we bring a project in is that there may not be that big of a community. And what we wanna do is build community. And that's, that's what we're doing with um, Marco here is trying to actually build community. Um, this is what the Lennox Foundation does is to create sustainable projects um, and to commercialize. Um, I'm going to keep going through this. You can look at it. You know, the, the bottom line, isolation and going it alone are no longer viable. Um, we are in an existential crisis. And I think all of us have uh, a sickened feeling that we're about to go um, uh, cascading off of uh, the climate cliff. And I think that at least, at the very least, we want to feel like we are doing something to actually change that. Um, and to create a different outcome. So we need mass collaboration. And that's at the foundation of what LF Energy is. So, you know, what I want to show you quickly before I pass it off is that, um, you know, one of the things that has made it particularly challenging as a community um, to figure out uh, how to talk with each other is to come up with a language um, a shared vocabulary. Um, and, you know, in that kind of very nerdy sense, really in many ways, what we're talking about 
is um, a taxonomy. And so what follows is um, a three level taxonomy that has become the foundation of what the application catalog is. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what a cloud native um, uh, future might look like with regards to how we uh, build out the plumbing of, of the future power system. Um, so at the very top are these five um, facets. And um, these facets represent capabilities um, that are essential to the functional um, high level operations of power networks. Um, and then come sort of these next buckets. And the reason why this has been so powerful for us as a community um, has been to be able to understand where we are, where are the places that actually need assistance um, in terms of the plumbing uh, so that we can uh, build something that doesn't exist, which is uh, the future. Um, and then this goes down to the third level. And these 200 or so um, facets or, or um, aspects of uh, the taxonomy uh, really represent um, what could be an application catalog. And I don't see us doing all of these because our job is not to cannibalize um, commercial activity, but it's to enable commercial activity. So that's, that's what we're most interested in. Um, so this kind of stack here um, is at its, this is what a cloud native uh, stack looks like. You know, you're looking at infrastructure and edge and distributed intelligence. You're looking at data and services and you're looking at business intelligence. And that business intelligence is the application catalog. Um, and that security runs through the whole thing. Um, and, you know, I think that sometime in the next couple of months, we'll do a whole session on security. Um, because um, it, I think it's really important to understand how we've been thinking about security and what we've been doing about security. Um, this is kind of where we've ended in terms of understanding what our stack is and shifting it from the taxonomy. Um, and you can look at the taxonomy in our landscape design. And I will put that link in um, when I pass it off uh, to Anto. Um, but uh, what, what we're looking at here is where our projects live um, in core business supporting services, um, uh, in uh, distributed intelligence and at the application level. And so I'm just gonna very quickly talk about at the infrastructure level, uh, you can see that the EV gateway is there, Everest. Um, on top of it is something called Fledge Power. Um, and FLEDGE stands for Fog Lamp Edge, and it comes from uh, the edge and uh, networking um, community. And what we've done is jointly launched FLEDGE Power. It's been driven by uh, utilities in Europe um, to ensure um, the ability uh, to integrate with 61850. Um, and FLEDGE Power is being used on thousands of devices and sensors um, in uh, the uh, French uh, transmission system um, and also in the distribution system at Oleander. Um, so this project is a very exciting project and I, I see them moving from uh, kind of more development and uh, getting uh, that, that um, 61850 integration um, to now taking this next level, which is putting it into the field. Open Leader is an open ADR. Um, it is demand response. It is driven <clears throat> by uh, the Netherlands um, and by um, uh, the Open Charging Alliance. Um, and it is being used um, in many different ways uh, to, um, uh, to provide a demand response between things like parking infrastructure and, and other kinds of assets that live at the edge. Um, HIFI. Um, you know, lives now um, in Aachen University, and uh, we're trying to actually build some great energy around it. It is a DC microgrid that allows and enables peer-to-peer -peer, um, uh, uh, energy sharing. 
Um, and uh, CPAP is a substation automation and virtualization. Um, we have taken this from an idea to actually now being in the field. Um, and so it, it's a little bit early, um, but some of the first commercialization, um, uh, GE is working on commercializing it. And some of the first um, examples are gonna start to be seen in the field um, in, in uh, the fall. Um, so that's kind of at the edge in distributed intelligence. In the core business supporting services, you'll see two things. And one is Compass, which is a substation configuration tool. And again, these are projects that were started out of an idea. Um, and this is like two years later, and they are now being used in the field. Um, Grid Exchange Fabric is a project that came from Oleander. Um, it is an IoT platform and enables you to build things on top of it. Um, it is what Oleander uses for their head end system for all of their meters. And it is also what Oleander uh, uses for their street lights. So I think that there are probably are a half dozen use cases that Oleander is using um, GXF for. Um, and I really uh, welcome you to take a look at it. Um, when we go down to um, when we go up to the business intelligence and the application catalog, um, we have a couple of different things going on here. Operator Fabric is a uniform HMI. That is a mature um, product. It's being used in the fields and it's being used um, in uh, control centers and control rooms um, in a number of different places in Europe. Um, grid Capacity Map um, is being developed by Vattenfall. Um, and a kind of a small cohort of people. Um, and it is going to enable um, visualization of a grid um, so that it can be understood from a nodal perspective where the best place to put capacity is um, that will lower the time for interconnection. Open Steph is short-term forecasting and um, it is, was driven by Oleander. Um, I, I have a lot of optimism around Open Steph and where they're going with it, um, and including um, being able to add a time series to this um, so that it can begin to drive uh, AI. <clears throat> um, possible, I know this is like a complete speed wrap through that, but you know, <laughs> Uh, I want to be able to turn this over and I'm way over time. Uh, possible is uh, came from RTE. It is what they use for visualizing their grid. There are now a number of different uh, commercial implementations of possible. Um, and it is a very powerful tool um, for calculating um, all aspects of power system simulation and uh, tooling. Um, Swanyo. Uh, maybe Anto will talk a little bit about that, but he brought this project in um, and we're very excited and proud. Um, one of the first commercial RFPs has gone out uh, for Swanyo. And uh, so we see uh, a lot of activity happening in terms of the commercialization process. Open e meter came from the United States and um, uh, we it came from the United States and um, and it is uh, being used to really look at avoided energy. Shapeshifter and flex measures are based on USIF, um, which is, uh, came out of uh, the Netherlands and it uh, enables congestion management and flexibility. And OpenGI is a market clearing and settlement and I am done. <laughs> so I'm gonna pass this off to um, Marco, who I hope will talk a little bit slower than I have. Um, but you can see that we went from a couple of projects and we have a lot going on at this point. Um, so Marco, do you wanna uh, take the share? Oh, Anto is gonna go next. Anto, do you want me to advance the slides? Yes, please. If you can run the slide for me, it would be great. Okay. Yeah, my, my aim today is to you know, talk as an academic explaining basically why I'm here. And uh, I would like to start saying that as an institute, we have been involved in open source since the beginning. As an academic, I strongly believe in the open source, but what we have been doing at the beginning or for a long time, I would say my institute is what I'm calling here homemade open source. So we 
we were developing projects, we were running a website. You can see we are still doing this for our small initiatives, but we were kind of like close on ourselves. So not many people could know about our projects. And so the impact we could have with our approach was in my view, rather limited. And that's why I would like to show you the story related to the project Sonia that was mentioned before as a good example on how getting into a community like the Linux Foundation Energy made a big difference for the quality and the value of the projects that we are running. I can go to the next slide. So let me start with the, with this Sonia. Sonia Original was a project funded by the European Commission program Horizon 2020. And the task we had in the project was to develop an open and modular platform for distribution grid automation. And uh, the project was quite successful. We, we were able to develop this architecture, not only but to implement and test in a variety of real field tests in real European grid. And so we built quite confidence that we were on, on the good route to understand how to tackle the challenges that distribution system operator are facing with the growing penetration of renewables. For that reason, if we could go to the next slide, we built on the experience of that project, developing a follow-up project and with a higher level of technology readiness level, which is still running, it's called Platonium, in which we expanded the view that, that Sonia project had, including, um, oh, can, can you stay in the previous slide? Thanks. Um, expanding with links to the market. So because, key point in the view of the European Commission is bringing customer, and that's why the access layer, and make them part of the energy market. And then, of course, we realize, commercially speaking, working with the real utilities, that you cannot come and disrupt everything and imagine that people will pick it up. So we developed a concept of link to legacy systems so the grid operator could expand their solution with our platform but still continuing some of the business as usual so that you can have a progressive uh, transition from classical scatter system and monolithic product to a modular microservice-based architecture uh, we were proposing. And then with the project, we increased our experience with larger field tests, one in Europe, one, sorry, in Italy, one in Germany and one in Greece, for which we learned a lot. And we strengthened the architecture understanding and enrich the number of services that we have available as DSO technical platform, still bringing the name Sonia from the original project for the platform. Then going to the next, uh, but then the question Ray arise. So, you know, in terms of the European Commission with an innovation action, which is like Platone, we should reach a level of maturity that is very close to commercial, which we think we are doing it, but we thought what comes next? And one of the critical problems we realized that normally we develop this large project, we do great things. And then when the funding are over, the project tends to die. And that's bad for us as academic. We don't have a way to continue performing research, but it's bad for the community that invested in projects that brought good results and then are not used. And that's where the idea came. Next slide uh, was, in contact uh, with the Linux Foundation before and participated to several calls. And then we decided the best thing for us would be to bring Sonio in the Linux Foundation. So we applied as a new project to the Linux Foundation Energy, proposing Sonio uh, to be the platform concept for grid automation. We mostly focus on distribution, but actually we're also looking at application that are possible transmission level and started decided to start creating a community around the project. And that's one of the big value um, that entering the Linux Foundation Energy gave to us. Going to the next, what happened then it immediately, what changed was the visibility. So I'm immediately the name of the project at a completely different level of visibility. I was invited for interview, uh, I, I was, you know, also very famous news uh, cast like Forbes wanted to know more about the concept. We won a very prestigious award in Germany uh, for our contribution because immediately was clear that our impact was getting at a completely different level because of the foundation. Next slide, please. And then you ask, no, next, please. And why? 
Well, because what do you earn as a project to get in the foundation are the points that I'm summarizing here in the slide. Open source project needs governance. It cannot be just uh, one academic entity putting software on GitHub to make something that industry will be interested, you need a governance around. You need a community, everybody needs to participate. Must be managed as a real industrial project to get to that level of credibility that alone putting something on GitHub or whatever, we cannot reach. So the other point is also you cannot do everything alone to make a product credible. There are so many aspects and maybe you as a researcher, you are not interested. You want to focus on what you're good at. And then last but not least, because of the community you're working closer to industry and you can really understand how to shape the future of the research you're doing all those points came clear and are clear consequences of, for us of bringing the project to the foundation as surely anticipated the clear result is currently in this week uh, is running a major step in a public tender for a DMS of a very large city in Europe that will use the Sony architecture. They put as requirements for company applying, responding uh, to the call that they have to fulfill the Linux Foundation Energy Standard and they have to follow the Sony architecture. That's to me really uh, bringing the project to life. That's as a scientist means starting from research, basic research on understanding automation to something that makes an impact in the community. Next slide, please. Yeah, with that, I gave you my message and I'm very happy to pass to Marco. Marco has been very, very nice industry partner that we had even before joining the foundation. I brought him to the foundation because I had my personal experience and I thought, I'm pretty sure Marco, you will love it. Come with us. Marco, floor is yours. Thanks, Anto, and, and thanks for bringing me in. Yeah, um, I hope you can see my screen. Um, I want to tell you also the story how we ended up with doing something open source as a startup. Uh, I myself have been a founder before, had created a drone startup, so, so uh, civil surveying drones, so measuring big landfills, road construction sites, and things like that. Our company transitioned into a big corporate after a while. And we did everything ourselves and just out of nothing after some years, even the big corporate couldn't compete any longer with anyone else because open source was taking over the market. It, nowadays, the situation is a bit like with the phone industry. There's the iPhone drone called DJI and everyone else is running open source. And why is it so? Because open source has the power of many. You know, the, the sentence on the shoulder of giants, you can read every time you use Google Scholar. And, um, that really kicked in, so no one could withstand that. And it was particularly that great because every university was building their newest drone algorithms on top of the existing drone algorithms. So it was really, really quickly growing. And we think EV charging is the next market where this should happen. It happened in many markets before and in many industries. And yeah, we think e-mobility is that the time is right to do this now. It's automotive, it's normally slow, it's energy, which is also really, really old corporate with the slow, but yeah, open source has just so many benefits. And if someone kicks this avalanche to happen, and that's what we want to do, we think it will happen and this industry will dramatically change. And yeah, so what I'm talking about now is Everest. So we are this tiny project here in this big software stack yeah, but actually we are not that tiny. So we are the entire firmware stack for EV charging station. If it's DC or AC, it doesn't matter. And why, the, why charging stations are so interesting is because they're sitting like a spider in a web and have a lot of connectivity everywhere. Uh, to There's human machine interfaces, a lot of cloud things. Uh, hint here is OCPP, open charge point protocols. You maybe want to connect apps, you maybe want to connect to the energy grid. Uh, like things Anto is doing. Um, you maybe have local energy generation, for example, SunSpec, you want to connect to your local solar inverter. Um, you have to steer uh, power electronics and electronics underneath. Uh, so you have to do with embedded things. You have cars, obviously, and there's also a lot of different standards and new standards coming all in all of the time. 
And yeah, so this is a field where we want to connect things. Yeah, and finally the human in the loop. And to do that, there's a lot of modules, a lot of protocol languages, languages which we prepared as modules, which you can switch out against another one. Um, it's really, really highly modularized and customizable. So if you want to build your own research project based on a special embedded firmware or running on a special hardware, you can do that. If you want to build a special local energy management with maybe some cloud magic in the background, you can maybe just switch out or extend the energy management module. So everything is highly modular. And if you don't want to code, you can still use something like Node-RED, which is a uh, yeah, home automation slash Internet of Things um, rapid prototyping toolkit, a bit like uh, MATLAB Simulink, um, where you have building blocks. And all of that is on an Apache license, so you can do with it whatever you want, except suing someone. Uh, and you can contribute back your research, you don't have to. But if you do so, next one could pick it up. And I mean, I myself did a lot of research in physics, and we always try to not only publish the paper, but also the source code, because we can bring basically our co-workers and everyone else on the next level. Yeah, um, so had a lot of line items, what we do, and this is the way how it looks underneath in the configuration interface. So you can speak to the charger uh, as a basically creator in the admin panel. Now you have here the manufacturer's view, and you can basically load all the modules you have for a particular charger. Can we wire them? Can configure certain modules? They even duplicate modules. Sometimes you maybe have multiple outlets for energy. So it's again, super flexible to be prepared, whatever you imagine, whatever you want to do next. Just to give you some uh, deeper insights, what we do in particular, for example, energy management as one of the highlights. Um, even though everyone try says they are good at uh, energy management, we really try to think from this at the beginning. And you can, with the drawing tool I just showed you, in the very near future, draw your local energy grid. What fuses do you have? What price forecast, solar forecast engines you're using in the cloud? You maybe have multiple outlets. And there's a local um, energy trading scheme which trades the energy across this network to make sure no fuses is blowing up. Every car reaches its charging goal. And yeah, there's, and this is just the beginning what we came up with. We're really, really curious what you would make out of that. And to help you with that, um, so yes, we are a startup, we wanna earn money, um, but not with this item here. This is just basically pure community support. We basically selling it for the cost of material. It's a small batch of development kit charges in case you wanna try out Everest. There is something Raspberry Pi based we're using for our own development. We're using with our industrial partners to rapidly prototype new software modules. Everest extensions. So if you're interested, just give me a call. We can arrange something. And these this charges I just showed to you will come certified to the market this year in summer. Already you can get some engineering samples and there's a lot of more software modules to come. I don't want to go through all of that in details. And also kind of it doesn't matter because this is what we think today, what we as Pionix want to contribute to that project but you can contribute something else, or you can convince us that we're doing something earlier. So we think that for example, OCPP 2.0 isn't needed short term because actually everyone is backporting features to the old stack, to the old version. So let's just continue with that one. That maybe you have a better guess and you, you think it's better to pull it in. Let's talk about that. Or you can do it your own. For example, energy management. Uh, EEBUS is the new protocol for local renewable energy um, home automation things. Um, it looks super awesome, but there's so little adoption. So we think at the moment, maybe better push it out because of our limited resources, but actually, actually we'll be super interested. Maybe someone would like to pick it up and it would integrate this. We also have uh, applied for Google Summer of Code projects. We have students and bachelor thesis as we're supporting. We're collaborating in uh, public research grants with, in, with academia. And yeah, we are super keen to see what others will build on top of that. What we will bring to the table is industrial adoption. So we are basically, that's our business model, making sure the software is get pushed into actual industrial use. So 
perspectively in 10 years from now in the ideal world, this will run then on more than half of the global charges. So whatever you now bring to the table could have a really, really impact on the long run. And that's what we're working on. We're supporting those industry partners, helping them to get the software adapted to their hardware charges, to provide them with Linux bugs fixes and building binary updates. So that's what we do. So you don't have to take care of that. And yeah, if you look on the entire industry, and that's also my, also my almost last slide. So Everest Linux Foundation Energy is the center of everything. We as Pionix try to push that forward. It's basically our baby and we put basically half of our money flows into that project. So we're really spending millions on getting that kickstarted. Um, and that also in really, really short amount of time. We have enthusiasts and hackers and makers we try to onboard in this community. We are next week in, uh, no, three weeks from now in the Netherlands on the European biggest hacker festival on the May Contain Hackers 2022 festival, in case you want to join us there. So we try to onboard them. We are talking to uh, charger OEMs, obviously, to bring that in. We're talking to component suppliers, for example, certain silicon manufacturers have interest, so their components becoming part of the future charging industry. So we're making sure that they are providing the drivers. So in the past, if you buy components as a researcher, you have to do all the software yourself to get it running. We're making sure whatever's on the market already runs with Everest, so you can get kickstarted immediately and we make them pay for it. A bit like you wouldn't pay for a graphic card driver nowadays. You're expecting that NVIDIA and others are, are giving you this software for free. That's exactly what we also make sure in the charging industry. And yeah, we have a lot of people who are looking into custom charging solutions. So building really niche products. Um, always call this like a cambric explosion, what we expect. Nowadays, if you want to build a charger for a certain use case, you need thousands and thousands of uh, and units of volume to make that happen. Uh, if you look to what happened in the Android phone market, you can build an app for a niche of people because app development, just a tiny piece of software is so simple. You don't have to make a custom phone for a weird use case. And we think the same will also be true for charging. There will be so many more charging use cases. Uh, we talk every day to news, new ones of them which we now enable by splitting basically hardware from software and by making it modular. So what does it mean for you as academia partners? Um, so in case you have a product, you need a custom charger with Bionics, we can help you with that, uh, like a dev kit for getting started. Um, yeah, if you just want to use some modules of this, like for example, open charge point protocol library, you can even use Everest or parts of Everest yourself, you don't have to reinvent everything. You can run it on your stuff. You don't have to ask anyone for permission. We're happy to get contribution, but as I said, it's not mandatory. And yeah, you can also just pick single libraries. And if you, let's say, not a software developer, but just doing researching on charging statistics, we're also happy to help you with setting up your own charging infrastructure park where you can collect stuff on. We maybe can even help you with doing some software extensions. So you don't even have to do software yourself to help us to grow Everest. So even con statistics like it never works with that car, never works with this cloud are helping us. Also bug reports are helping us. Um, in that sense, I'm really, really curious to see what are your interests and would like to open up the stage. And if you're not able to talk to the audience today, please give me a call, give me a ping. I'm looking forward to talk to each and every one of you after this meeting. So, and I think we should now go over to asking by chat of our audience, Shuli and Linux Foundation staff, what we yeah. have. Um, I think the question is about moving standards from FRAND. Um, to CC by 4.0, um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure uh, that the policy part of this is apropos, um, but I don't know, Marco or Anto, do you have any comments that you would want to make about this? I, I'd like to kind of stick to Everest and... Um, yeah, uh, to be honest, I'm... I would have to do further reading to understand the question. So I think the 
the license scheme we have with Apache 2.0 license is really, really open. I think there are two restrictions. The first one is you can't sue anyone. And the second one is as soon as you contribute code, you're waiving all patents related to that code. So you can't even sue someone for violating your patents if you contributed the code for that. Um, which is a good thing because, Scooty, you told me about some submarine projects which almost killed certain Linux Foundation things. So that some people have used that in a nasty way, this patent scheme. So I think Apache 2.0 is actually the best we can do as a community. Um, any other questions? Anything? Um, you, I think we can also bring people off mic if you uh, want to talk. I don't know. Uh, Carly, are we able to do that? Can you repeat that, Shuli? Yeah, can we bring people off mic so that they yes. can? Mm -hmm. um, other other folks, other comments. Um, uh, what are you guys working on? Um, what is it that's interesting? Um, how do you see the intersection of those things? You guys are all being really shy. <laughs> Anybody want to raise your hand? If anyone has a question, feel free to raise your hand and I can press allow to talk. Okay, well, this is a very quiet group. Um, I think Marco on the next slide is, um, is my information. Um, it doesn't have my uh, uh, meeting, but please send me an email and uh, we can set up a time to talk. I'm, I'm really interested in the research that you all are doing and how Everest could support you or how LF Energy could support you. Um, so in, in your pri private worlds, <laughs> you, you can send uh, me an email or Marco an email. Anto, do you want to put your email in? Uh, anything that you guys want to say in closing? Um, uh, you know, I, I kind of wanted to have a conversation, but I, I can't, um, can't make anybody talk. I think I recognize a lot of people from the audience because I invited some of you personally. So happy to see, oh, there's someone raised his hand. So I'm really looking forward to work with you. Um, Madhuban, sure, I'd love to hear from Madhuban. And there's the next hand. Uh, so you can um, un unmute Madhavan and then you can talk. I think you started. Can you hear me now? Yes, absolutely. Okay, hello. Uh I guess very quickly, you know, thank you for just giving me this, you know, whistle stop tour because we're still getting onboarded. I am just, I mean, literally just getting to work with you guys and super excited. So I would, you know, welcome the opportunity to, in the first instance, just take it in because I also joined the call a little bit later. But surely I will reach out to you because I do have some thoughts in terms of possibly one or two other projects that we can bring to the table and would love to, you know, just talk to you a little bit further. That's terrific. I'm really happy to meet you. Um, Madhavan is with a company called uh, Carbon Laces. Yes, correct. And um, uh, you're more of a VC based group. <clears throat> No, we're basically building, you know, kind of what we say is using real data to help financial services make the decisions, you know, quickly. So, um, so less of a VC, but more about going, you know, and addressing something called financed emissions. Great. Well, I'm really happy to welcome you 
as um, our uh, most recent um, join to LF Energy. And I look forward to having some time with you. Look forward. Uh, absolutely. Marco, I don't know how to, um, so you can unmute yourself. Marco has permission to speak on here. Marco, you can unmute yourself. Marco Mittelsdorf, the other Marco. Maybe, Shuli, can you answer the question from the chat? Is there any commitment from the universities uh, if they join LF Energy? Well, you know, we've had many universities join. You can see kind of on our list, we probably have a half dozen universities. Um, we welcome all the universities and all the research community. And what I'd like to say is, you know, maybe this is the beginning of something and we we figure out how to create a really robust uh, research environment. Um, and, uh, you know, we get you guys engaged. Um, you know, we, we would, Love if we could get a postdoc. Um, I think that there's ways that we can also do um, some funding um, using a, a kind of community bridge to be able to um, see if we can uh, en enable funding for a postdoc. So th those things would be great. Uh, Lynn, uh, do you wanna come off mic and ask the question? Can we unmute un Lynn? There she is. <laughs> Thanks. Hi. Sure. Hi. Uh, I'm uh, really interested to learn about all of these technologies and, and these developments and the growing LF Energy ecosystem, which, as you know, I've been following for several years. Um, but speaking as probably the only social scientist in the room, I think there's a lot of opportunity to see more engagement with market design academics, in, especially in application development and in the application layer, right? Because I know Marco referred to a development of a local energy market, and surely you said something about peer-to-peer -peer energy. Uh, I, my work is in transactive energy, and, uh, and so I think um, incorporate, and, and I've done a lot of work on interoperability and standards as well uh, on the Gridwise Architecture Council. And so I think that there's a, a really good opportunity to synthesize the more engineering aspects of development with the social science analysis and aspects of market design and regulatory institutional design to the extent that the regulatory context really affects design choices and the potential for open source implementation and adoption. So if there's any opportunity to integrate the social science and the technical, you know, social science technical analysis and engineering technical analysis, um, I think that would be a really worthwhile direction to go. I totally agree with you. Um, and <laughs> For better or worse, I probably identify as a social scientist too, but not on the economic end, but more on the behavioral and the uh, adoption. And um, so I, I'd love to see something like that. You know, I, I kind of backed myself into the corner because I started to talk about each of the projects. And by the time I got to Shapeshifter and Flex Measures and Open EE Meter, I wasn't really able to talk about them very much. But I think those three projects in particular um, and OpenGI, I think also as well. OpenGI is the software that allows for project origins and project origins actually is driving the granular certificates market. Um, and so, you know, Shapeshifter is how congestion management is, is managed. Um, but Flex Measures is actually around aggregation. Um, we also, Own Connect just joined LF Energy as well. I don't think anybody, I don't think I saw John or any of the folks from Ohm Connect. Um, but you know, my, my greatest hope would be that yes, we could provide uh, a sandbox for being able to uh, jointly develop software and to have it go through rapid iterative um, market design. Um, 
you know, engagement. Like, I think, I can't think of anything better. That thing, that sounds really good to me. Um, I don't exactly know how to make it happen, um, but maybe there are folks on the call who can maybe, help maybe with I, that. Also in the um, Everest project, we had once discussed with some partners and project idea, I mean, EV charging, there's a lot of different things you can do to make it smart, like loading, charging at the right moment in time, discharging. But let's say technically, there's so many things you can do, but what is the most simple way to so even, let's say the elderly understand what they're doing with maybe one or two buttons, uh, not giving too many choice. So it should be optimal for the user and it should all be optimal for the grid and the society. And what is the most simple system? What is actually capable of that? I, as an engineer, will overcomplicate it. So we really need to, to find the sweet spot here. Well, Lynn, if you have any ideas, um, I think I'm very interested. Yeah, we should uh, definitely talk. We're overdue for a catch up anyway. Thanks. L long over overdue. Um, I need to turn this over to Marco and Anto. Um, I. I don't know how I did this, but I think it was because there were not calendar invites, but I am on a panel that that starts in three minutes and um, where they wanted me to show up 10 minutes before. So I am going to have to sign off. Um, my email, I think uh, Marco put it back in correctly, is this, I am uh, accessible and I would love to talk to you all. So thank you very much. I'm gonna turn it over and quietly leave. So if anyone has any further questions, we can also dive into technical details. I have some more minutes. Otherwise, as said, please give me a call and we can also talk this through one by one. And I think that's also true for Anto. <laughs> There's a lot of thanks a lot messages here. So we will put this recording on YouTube in the next days. Um, also there you will find, find all the links in the description below. So it seems like there's no further question here then. Yeah, let's stop it and wish you all a great morning, evening, night, wherever you are on the globe. Yeah, let's same from my side.